used we, we, we will be using the okay the meeting just started the recording just started so i will go over what i've said so you can get the data for this tutorial from the data folder under week one's google drive uh, folder and i will be using the diabetic underscore data uh, data for this tutorial and you can also find the notebook inside the week one's uh, folder and it's the data cleaning transformation extraction jupyter notebook so on jupyter notebook you can run the let me close that and you can run uh, the the sales each sales after uh, getting the data and mounting it to your drive or you can also upload that uh, to the collab environment or uh, you can directly mount the data from your google drive so the first thing when you are given a data when you are given any kind of data set the first thing that you want to do is uh, try to visualize the data try to understand what data that the, the data that you have the features that the data contains and the number of rows and etc so after understanding the data that you have almost all data sets that you are going to work on uh, won't be clean you will have to uh, work on some kind of cleaning transformation and extracting the features that are important or relevant for the model that you are going to work on so uh, every data i think you are you, you have also worked on week zero challenge there was some kind of cleaning that need, that was supposed to be done on the twitter data some of the cleaning were uh, removing the duplicates converting the data time format in typecasting for some of the features. So we are going to go over some basic or necessary uh, transformations or data cleaning that you are going to do or that you have to do for this week's challenge. So the first thing is importing the data, the necessary libraries that you will be using for the data cleaning as well as the visualization. So pandas will be primarily used for reading the data that we have. NumPy will be using NumPy for some kind of uh, product operation or multiplication between different the between the data that we have we'll be going over that and i've used ipython for displaying uh, anime so i've already run this sale and after that if you are going to mount your drive or if your data is inside your google drive what you have to do is you'll have to first import drive from google.colab then you'll have to mount uh, that drive because you need to access the contents inside your drive. The first thing that you have to do is to mount that drive on your collab environment. After you mount this drive on your collab environment, you'll have access to all of the data that are inside your Google Drive. So I'll be using from a shared drive of the Academy, but I don't think this will work for you. After mounting, okay, drive is already mounted for me. After mounting the drive, what you can do is you can go to your drive and uh, locate that specific file or that specific csv file that you want and uh, load it to your data set so for you this is this pause is specific for my uh, for my uh, for my lo location inside the google drive so for you you might do dv calls pd.read csv and uh, pause to your csv inside your drive and you can copy this and i'll comment this out so what you can do is you can uh, first upload the data to your drive or upload it directly to the collab session so after you upload the data to your drive after mounting it to your collab environment you can get the pause of your data directly and uh, you can start working on the data so the arguments that we use is the first thing is the pause to the data set that you are going to work on and the next argument is the any value so uh, we want to explicitly tell to pandas to uh, use these values as uh, none uh, values in the data set. So by default, I think only the none or the none are used as uh, none or not a number value in pandas. But if there are some other values that you want to tell pandas to load them as uh, none, you'll 
have to explicitly uh, specify them in your any values argument. So what we did is we specified or we give the question mark in the none values to be used as none when loading the data set. So I will load my data set and using the db.head we can at least have some basic idea about what our data consists of, the number of columns or Okay, uh, yes, Abner. Uh, what are we saying when we say we would put uh, question mark there? For example, in our data set, there is uh, a value called uh, undefined. So, should we list the, the, the keyword undefined uh, in the curly brackets? Uh, yes, if you already know. Most of the time, you won't know what your data contains or what your data consists of. But if you are familiar with the data set that you are going to work on, you can specify the values that so that pandas will consider them uh, as nuns when reading the data set. But if not, you will you just can. This argument and after that for the for the any values what you're going to specify uh, is the values that you want to be read as none or as not a number uh, instead of being read as a value okay, okay. thank you yeah no problem so anyone if you have any one of you if you have a question please uh, feel free to ask directly by unmuting your mic because i want to be able to see the uh, screen the meet screen okay so uh, after reading the data, we will now have the basic understanding of what our data consists of. It, it has the encounter, the encounter ID, the patient number, and other features that we are going to work on. And most of them, as we can see from the head of from the head of the data set, they contain none and different other values. So, I think on tomorrow's tutorial session, we are going to. Uh, look in depth about exploratory data analysis or EDA, but for now we are just going to go over the basic exploratory data analysis or the basic EDA that you have to work on when you start working on your data set, when you, are, when you start using your data set. So uh, before cleaning a data set, you need to explore what has been stored in it, the column names, how many data points, number of column, all these questions need to be answered. So every cleaning that you are going to go over or any kind of pre-processing uh, will need will require you to understand the data that you have. Because unless you know the data type that you are going to work on or the number of features, the number of missing values and so on, you won't even start uh, to clean or uh, start to pre-process the data. So the first thing that we have to do is we'll first look into the columns that we have. So db.columns, data, the data frame.columns, dot to list will list all of the columns that we have. So. Uh, we have this is the columns that we are going to work on we can also um, we can also uh, db dot columns so what lane in python does is it lists out or it prints the number of uh, columns that we, we specify so db dot columns will uh, list all of the columns so using the lane property from Python, we can uh, know the number of columns that we have. So we have about 50 columns. So these are the columns that we have and their number is 50. And we can also know, or we can also get the data type of the column. So by saying db.dtypes, yes, objects, okay. I think we'll have to remove the parentheses. So, by using the data types on the data frame, we can also list the data types of each column. So encounter ID is an integer, patient number is an integer, race, gender, age, uh, our objects, and so on. So when you're working, you might even look from the beginning that some of the uh, columns or some of the features aren't in the right format or in the appropriate format. So you might have to convert them into their appropriate format. For example, date might not be in the date format it might be in an object format. So that would be something that we would need to work on. So this will give you an overview or a basic understanding of the data that you are going to work on. 
so for better understanding of the columns, exploring the data description here. So I think this description link will lead you to uh, the data set description that you are going to work on for this week, which is the tele which is the telecom data analysis. So each of the yes, so this is an Excel file. So there you will get a data description for each of the columns that you have, but uh, in a real world, you might not get the description of each of the features that you are going to work on. So you might go uh, over the data set that you are going to work on and you might have to go back and forth to the client that you are going to work on. So let's say you are employed as a data analyst or data engineer for some client or even a data scientist for some client, you might have to go over the client after having a basic understanding of the data, of the data that the client gave you you might want to go and make sure that you understand what each of the features or what each of the columns uh, are uh, saying or what they stand for. So the bearer ID is the XGR session identifier, the duration is, is the total duration of the XGR in millisecond and so on. So for each of the features or for each of the columns, we need to understand what they are saying or what they are implying in our data set. So some of them might have higher feature importance for our machine learning model, some of them might not have. So not only our models or not only our exploratory data analysis would be helpful. We need to understand the description of the columns or the features that we have uh, before going on, the, on building the machine learning model or any kind of further analysis. So uh, by using the shape, the shape arguments will print the number of rows that the data has. Let me just print that. So DB is our data frame. So what db.shape does is it will uh, print a tuple, which the first one is the number of rows that the data has, and the second one is the number of columns that our data has. So this one has about 101,766 rows in 50 columns. So by using db.shape of zero rows and db.shape of one, will be for the, will stand for the columns and the first one will stand for the number of rows. So we can see that there are about 101,000 rows in 50 columns. This will just give us a basic insight of the data that we are going to work on. So as we have seen earlier or above, we have seen that our data consists of none values and uh, yes, there are a lot of missing values. So we need to handle the missing value that we have before working on any, on any kind of machine learning model because the num values will uh, will take the analysis or will shape the analysis in a way that we do not want. So we we'll, we we'll need to handle that before working on further analysis. So there are different ways to uh, handle missing values. Okay, is that the question? Josias. Yes, I would like you to come back on the on the question mark. Uh, in place of the missing value, I would like to know if if there is a question mark in place of the missing value uh, in place of the missing values in the data set in the CSV file. Uh, in the data that you are going to work on for this week. Yes. Yes. Uh, okay. I'm not sure about that, but uh, maybe you can work on further analysis and uh, explore if there are any such type of characters that you don't want them to be present, but I'm not exactly sure about that. So I would like to know why are you using the question mark then for NA and A values? So this is, get your answer. this is for another data set. We are not using the same data set that you are going to be working on. I've used the diabetic underscore data dot CSV from the uh, Google Drive folder. This is a different data set, which is only for this tutorial session. Oh, all right. And if I, if I understand, there are, uh, 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 we, have, we have the question marks in, in that data set. Yes. All right. So as I've said earlier, you might not know that there are question marks or any other special characters that you don't want them to be present in your data. So you'll have to know, or you'll have to do further analysis on your data set. And if there are any, you might easily replace them uh, using the any underscore values arguments. Okay, thank you. Okay. No problem. Uh, yes, Abner? 
uh, I wonder if I know uh, what uh, a variable name uh, local uh, position numbers and I, do, I don't I don't understand what does mean in the data set that we are given. Uh, which one? Uh, last location name, the variable name called last location name, not on your data, but uh, from our data. Uh, here? Yes, last location name. Here it is. Okay, I think it's, I'm not exactly sure about it, but it specifies the user location call name. Uh, maybe the coordinates. Yeah, have you tried to load the data and have an overview of the head of the data? Of and... course, of okay. course, of course. Uh, but and... it is uh, a number, I'm not sure if it is um, a coordinate, but uh, it has some format, which is okay. not clear. Okay, uh, maybe after this session, I will, I will try to have a look and we'll get back to you on the Slack channel. Okay, thank you. Okay. Uh, uh, any more question? Okay. Uh, so handling missing value. There are different ways to handle missing values. So the first thing that we want to do is to calculate the percentage of the missing values because uh, based on the percentage of the missing values, we might ha we might decide to handle them differently. Uh, so. The first thing we will try to, to normally do is to calculate the percentage of the missing values. So uh, first we get the total sales. The total sales is the total number of uh, rows and columns multiplied each other. So by using np.product of dev.shape, uh, as we have seen earlier, dev.shape will give you the number of rows and the number of columns. So np.product, what np.product will do is it will multiply those uh, rows and columns and will assign that to total sales and uh, to get the missing count dev.isnl.sum will uh, return the number of uh, will return the, num the, the number of missing uh, rows for each column so i think we can have a look at that separately so our data frame is db and if we can use db.isnl uh, first thing let's just try to look at what db.isnl uh, will print out. So for each of the rows, it will print if there is a missing value. So if there is a missing value or if it's a missing value, it will print true. If not, it will uh, print false. So when using sum, we'll aggregate the data and we'll uh, print out the number of missing values for each of the uh, columns. So when I run this cell, so for encounter ID, there are zero number of rows missing. For patient number, zero. For race, about 2,000 rows are missing. For weight, about 98,000 missing. So this is a large number compared to the total data set that we have. We have about 101,000 number of rows. Out of that, about 98,000 is missing for the weight feature. And the list goes on. So we can also add .sum in here. and what this will do is it will print the total number of uh, missing values for our data set. So we have about uh, 374,000 uh, missing values from the rows and the columns. So by missing count, we'll assign the number of missing values for each column. And to calculate the total missing, as I have showed you earlier, the missing count, which is dev.isnl.sum, dot sum will give you the total number of missing value for the data set. So the database data set contains, we'll round it to two decimal numbers and we can calculate that by using total missing over total sales. So when we run this sale, you can see that the data set has about 7.35% missing value. So this is a function which we can use in our script or in our, uh, in our projects again and again. So one thing that you can do is, I think this was also specified in the introductory session for today's by Yabebal. Uh, we have we have been seeing what you guys have been doing. It's really great on your, your GitHub submission is really good, but if, if, if there is something or if there is a function that you are going to reuse again and again in different data sets, you'll have to move them out from those scripts because 
one of the best approach in software engineering or data data science data engineering related projects is the dry approach or do not repeat yourself uh, uh, approach so you can move this to a separate script and you will be able to import this percent missing from that script and use that to work on so you can you shouldn't uh, write these specific scripts, these specific scripts again and again for your uh, data sets that you are going to work on. So if you can modularize them and even implement the object oriented uh, procedure, you can reuse your scripts again and again on different data sets without repeating the entire code section. So yes, uh, our data is about 7.5% missing value. This is what we printed earlier. So it looks like our columns has lots of missing values. So we need to handle uh, the missing values that we have. So there are different ways of uh, filling or fixing missing values. Uh, so the rule of thumb is for all projects or data types, for object data types, as I've shown you earlier, yes, in the data types of our columns, some of them are integers, some of them are objects. Yes, I think most of them are objects and the others are uh, integers. So for object data type, we will want to use the mode method to fill the missing values. So the mode is the most frequent appearing value in that column. So by using the mode, we can fill the missing values for data types of columns, uh, for data type of object type. But for numerical columns, we can use a separate, a different approach when uh, trying to fill up missing values. So uh, in, in, there are different ways or there are different criteria to be chosen for, okay, Asabna. Uh, uh, sorry for interrupting, but can we leave uh, missing uh, certain rows or columns if uh, uh, we, 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 we believe that the, the row or the column is not necessary for our target? Yes, what you can do is, uh, I will come back to that later, but you can drop the entire column or the entire row. If you think or if you are certain that those rows or those columns aren't important uh, for your machine learning model or data analysis. If not, most of the time you won't be sure when working on a data set that you are not familiar. So you will want to find a way to fill those missing values by uh, following some approaches. But if you are certain or if you are very sure that those columns or those rows don't matter for your data analysis and machine learning model, you, are, uh, you can remove that from your data set entirely. Okay, thank you. Margaret? Um, hi, um, my question is about uh, when dropping the rows that have missing values, uh, what's the minimum number of rows you're supposed to remain with when you remove the, the rows with missing values? So it will be like the perfect number of rows for, for doing a data analysis. Mm, yeah, I, I think there are different points of view on that. Some say that 10% uh, would be okay to completely remove that from our data set. But uh, you'll also find some saying or disagreeing with that and uh, some will have a different view of point saying we shouldn't remove uh, rows or columns entirely unless we are really certain uh, that we can remove those rows from our data. But depending on the type of project that you are working on and uh, the type of data sets that you have, if you are very sure or certain about the uh, rows that you are going to remove, feel free to remove them. Uh, if they are less than 10 or 15% uh, from your data set. If not, uh, I think it's best to handle them in a different way. Mm, Margaret? Uh, yeah, that's, that's okay, makes sense. Okay, uh, so, when handling or when filling up missing values for numerical columns, which is in our case the int, the integer columns, uh, there are different uh, uh, criteria to be uh, analyzed or to be checked before selecting uh, 
uh, the method that you are going to use to fill up the missing values. So in normal distribution, if our data is distributed normally, or if it's a normal distribution, we'll try to talk about that uh, in the next section. But if it's a normal distribution, what we mean by normal distribution is the mean divides the curve symmetrically into equal, equal parts at the median, and the value of skewness is zero. So skewness is a statical term which uh, will show us will or which will enable us to know if a data is normally distributed or not. It's just a stat term which is just a measure of asymmetry of a distribution. So if its skewness is zero, it means that the distribution is normal or it's normally distributed. So that the data on the left will be equal to the to the data on the right side. But when it, when a distribution is uh, asymmetrical, the tail of the distribution is skewed to the one side and to the right side or to the left. And when the value of the skewness is negative, so skewness is the measure of the distribution of our data. And when when skewness is when the skewness the measure of the skewness is negative, the tail of the distribution is longer towards the left side. Uh, of the curve and in this type of distribution the mean the median and the mode of the distribution are negative rather than uh, positive or zero so if you have a negative uh, skewness uh, of the data distribution we can see that it's uh, negatively distributed but when the value of the skewness is positive the tail of the distribution is longer towards the right side of the curve and in this distribution type the mean the media and the mode of the distribution are positive rather than negative or zero so back to the to, back to the rule of thumb that if the data is not skewed uh, meaning that if the skewness is zero it's not skewed to the right or to the left then we have a normal distribution uh, then we can fill the data or the missing values with either the mean or the median but if it is skewed then we'll have to choose the median to fill the missing values. So I just imported an image from the internet to just to show you about the skewness or the distribution of the, of the data. So this is a normal distribution. So by normal distribution, we mean that 50% of the data that are on the right side are also equal to the left side, which is 50%. So all of the data that you have on the right side will be equal to the left side and the median will be the center and it will be equal to the mean and to the mode. So when the mean, the median, and the mode are equal, uh, we can see that it's uh, normally distributed. And when it's positively, okay, Margaret. Um, from the graph you're showing, you said there's data on the positive and negative side. Um, on our data, do you like, does it mean that the data is like divided into two and then you check if they're, they're equal or what's the x and y? In your, in your... Uh, yes, I, I will come over to that. But when you are given any kind of data, you can check for the skewness, uh, maybe by using uh, the skew property or the skew method, uh, which is built in Python, or even uh, plot some diagrams and have a look if a data is positively skewed, negatively skewed, or normally distributed. Uh, we'll, we'll come to that part. Mohammed? Uh, how we can calculate uh, the distribution? Yes, I, I, I'm coming to that part. Thank you. Okay, so this is positively skewed because the tail is longer to the right side, and here the mean is greater than the median, and uh, the median is also greater than the mode. And this is an, a diagram for negatively skewed. In When the data is negatively skewed or negatively distributed, the tail is longer on the left side and the mode is greater than the mid, the median and the median is greater than uh, the mean. So uh, to calculate uh, the skewness, we can use dev.skew on axis equals zero, which will calculate on column and y. So our data, frame was db, yes, db, and we can use db.skew, axis equals zero. So this will print out uh, the skewness uh, for, each, uh, for each column. So for the encounter ID, you can see that this is positively skewed because it's, up, it's greater than zero. Patient number is also greater than zero. Some are 
less than zero. Yes. So by using the skew property or the skew method on the data frame, you can easily uh, have a look if the data is distributed normally, positively, or in a negative way. Uh, I think you can also use uh, plots. So for example, uh, maybe in one of the columns, number of medications, let's use number of medications. So if of number of medications, plot, we can, uh, we can plot the histogram uh, of that specific column. Mm. Okay, it's TV. So if I plot the histogram of uh, number of medications, we can clearly see that the data is skewed uh, positively. So here also it's greater than zero. Uh, you can also use Seaborn. I think there is a separate session tomorrow in data exploration and analysis. Import Seaborn as SNS. And then by using Seaborn, there is a library called uh, Displot. Displot. And we'll give the data frame uh, and the column that we are, want to use. Mm, I think we have to provide. Yes. So Seaborn is similar to Matplotlib. It just gives you a uh, much better visualization in terms of the look and feel. So we can see from both of the diagrams that our data is positively skewed. So after having a look at each column or on the entire data set, we can decide to fill the missing values by using either the mean or the median for the numerical columns. That's all. Yeah, no, thank you, Lydia. Uh, how, how much, uh, what does the uh, value actually represent? I mean, which values do we consider to be highly skewed? For example, if the range is greater than 10, 5, 1, uh, because I see some of them are like, really small values yes yes the the yes that that's correct Fasa. so what you have to look or the only factor that you are going to see is uh, as it's in the uh, uh, on the section for the uh, missing values if the skewness is greater than zero you'll use or you'll you're you'll be sure that it's negatively skewed i, I mean i'm sorry if the data is if the skewness is less than zero that's negatively skewed. And if the data is greater than zero, that's positively skewed. If the skewness is equal to zero, that's a normal distribution. Some might uh, have much larger values. Some have, might, might have much lower values compared to the others. But if, if it's zero or exact zero, that's a perfectly normally distributed uh, data. But if it's above zero or below zero, we can conclude that the data or that specific features or columns uh, aren't normally distributed. So uh, we calculate the, the skew of the data. Uh, mm -hmm. So we can, so we could uh, figure out w which value we could fill the missing values with. Yes, just to uh, fill up the missing values with, by using the median or the mean. Okay, thank you. Okay. Uh, Mohammed, was that the question? Yes, yes. That, okay. that was my question. Yes. Oh, okay. Joseph? Yes. Uh, I would like to know if, in, in this case, if we have, if we don't have exact zero, so we won't, we won't consider that uh, the data is normally distributed. Because uh. I, I I, I was talking about, I was thinking that we won't never have an exact zero. Then mm. it will be like, we always say that we fill the data with the, with the median. So I, I would like to know what if we have something like 0 0.002 or 0 0.1, will we, I would like to know if we can, we can, we can consider them 
has exact zero and and then use the mean to uh y yes i think that's a good question because uh, uh we have some kind of judgment right so if we see a data it's not a perfect if and else condition statement we can use our judgment and we can say that if they are really close to zero uh, we can conclude that it's normally distributed because we might not always expect the data distribution to be exact the skewness to be exactly to zero if it's nearly equal to zero or almost equal to zero we can say that it's normally distributed and we can use the appropriate method to fill the missing values but if we have the data or a distribution that is much higher or above than zero or below zero we can choose the other methods to fill the missing values okay but i would like to know if if there is a specific statistical test in order to test that if the uh, is zero or not in this case uh, uh, I'm, I'm sorry I, I said if there is a statistical test in order to test if the skewness is equal to zero or not in this case, and then we want we we will base our judgment on the test. Okay, so the normal theory says that if the skewness is exactly equal to zero, that's a normal distribution. If it's above zero, that's positively skewed and not a normal distribution. And if it's below, that's negatively skewed. But uh, I, I think using our personal judgment i'm not exactly sure if there are other uh, theory in this part but uh, we can uh, if the data is almost or nearly equal to zero uh, i think it's perfectly fine to use the other method uh, which is similar to the normal distribution okay well uh, i was i was i was talking about the statistical test like uh, we test the new hypothesis the skewness that we found is equal to zero against an alternative hypothesis. So mm. I'm asking if it is is possible to perform uh, such kind of test. So are you referring or are you using those terms or uh, do you want to use other uh, tests to make to just make sure that if the data is normally distributed or not? Yes, it is it's, uh, specifically about when I have to judge if I will consider the, the value close to zero or not. So uh, I might be wrong. That's why I was, I was asking about the existence of a statistical test. Yes, I think there might be other tests as well, but uh, just to be sure or just to be sure which method uh, you want to choose your you have to choose you can also plot the graph of that specific column and have a look if the data is normally distributed positively distributed or negatively distributed because once you plot the diagram it is really clear that the data isn't normally distributed for this case right yeah so uh, i think you can also use another tests that are available. I'm not exactly sure about uh, other tests, but I'm sure that there are other ways to find out the skewness or the distribution of the data that we have. But you can plot, you can use the skewness uh, to calculate the skewness, uh, or even, yes, and also using the plot, you can make sure uh, if that the method that you are going to use will be, uh, or will work fine or perfectly for uh, your use case. Okay, I think it's okay now. Thank you. Okay, uh, Michael. Hello, hello, you did Hello. Can you hear me? Yes. Uh, I was just uh, uh, trying to ask that. Uh, what if uh, after we impute the data with some uh, median or mode, uh, our skewness will deviate from what we have? Uh, originally and how we would uh, handle that how we are preparing to handle that uh, yes i think that's also another excellent question uh, when imputing our data there are also other methods to be used but uh, we can also use the the fill in need to fill the data with zeros but filling up our data set the missing values on our data set with zeros isn't really good and uh, will really vary or take the mean or the yes special especially the 
average of our data to that to the extreme point so filling up with the mean is the standard or what's suggested by other developers but you can go ahead and try i think when there is also a method to fill up missing values by using impute the impute method uh, and uh, not impute but interpolate so what interpolate does is it will fill up the data or the missing values by taking somehow the average or it will try to put or to place the data that is close to the data that's above the data and below the that specific data i'm just trying to yes so for example let's say um, okay uh, maybe this might not be uh, okay let's just say that this specific value was not this one but this specific value uh, wasn't 250 and it was none and uh, we can use inter the interpolate method in the data frame that we can use it's a method in in our data frame so when you use the interpolate method what interpolate does is i, I think there are uh, several methods to be used inside interpolate we can use the linear method you can use the time method and other methods as well so if you use the linear method what it will do is since 250 or this specific row and this specific column is in between 250.01 and 250.43 it will try to find a specific point that is in the middle between 250.01 and 250.43 so i think 250 is really good but based on the method passed to interpolate it might be in the time wise or linear wise it will try to fill up a value that is most close to the points above and below so it will make sure or uh, we can make sure that the data that's being filled is much more accurate or uh, much more relevant for our data set and it won't, it won't affect the mean in the yes the mean of our distribution so there are other methods as well to fill up missing values but the most common ones that i'm showing you right now is to fill up with the mean or the median but sometimes that might also affect the distribution so uh, we might have to go uh, again and again or try different uh, approach to fill up missing values okay okay thank you okay uh, was there another question or okay uh, i will then move on Mm. So, yes, by using the rule of thumb, we can fill up the missing values based on the, their category. If they are numerical or if they are an object, then after we know that they are numerical or object for object to use mode, and for numerical, based on the, the type of distribution, we can use uh, uh, we can use the mean or the median to fill up missing values. Okay. Uh, was that the question or okay uh, going to the next section so the next section is the transforming part of our data that's transforming our data so uh, by transformation we are primarily talking about feature scaling uh, and in feature scaling the most popular terms in feature scaling are the standardization and the normalization and what we mean by sorry so what we mean by feature scaling is and the first thing that i think we need to ask ourselves is why we need feature scaling and why do we have to scale our data and uh, in machine learning algorithms machine learning algorithms just see numbers and if there is a vast difference in the range say few ranging in thousands and few ranging in tens and it makes the underlying assumptions that the higher ranging numbers have uh, superiority in of some sort and this more significant number starts playing more decisive role while training the model uh, so for example let's say in if you have a data set containing uh, numbers numerical values and some of them might have uh, higher dimensions or higher magnitudes than the other columns or the, the other features so the much what the machine learning algorithm will try to do is it will give more weight to those that are uh, in higher magnitude than 
uh, that are in lower magnitude. So we need to scale our data based on the data set that we have and based on the machine learning algorithm that we are going to use. So in unsupervised learning like Canyon or chemist clustering, the algorithms are based on calculating the Euclidean distance between the magnitudes of the features. So in Canyon or chemist clustering, what the algorithm does is it tries to calculate the Euclidean distance between different points in our data set. And if it's not scaled, meaning that if the magnitudes is a very large number of each features, the feature with a higher value range starts dominating when calculating the distances. So if they are not scaled to the appropriate value, features having higher magnitudes will uh, dominate the algorithm, the machine learning algorithm, and the algorithm will give more weight to that uh, features. And in other deep learning algorithms or deep learning uh, methods, even linear regression, if they are not scaled, they are mostly based on finding the global minima when uh, doing the algorithm or uh, when trying to find the appropriate or the minimal point in the, uh, uh, in, the in, in the machine learning model. So finding the global minima is the final goal in deep learning or linear regression or other regression uh, algorithms. So on each iteration, if, if, if you have a higher magnitude of data in our features, first thing is that we won't be able to find the global minima uh, quickly. So it will not converge uh, as quick as it has to. So by scaling our data or by scaling our features, we'll make sure that we'll co the graph will converge much faster than the graph which the features haven't scaled, uh, which haven't been scaled. So by scaling our data, we can make sure that the convergence will be much faster and the global minima will be reached uh, much quicker. So the ways are we can use the normalization or standardization. So by normalization, we mean that uh, transforming data to have a mean of zero and standard deviation of one. And this means that we are trying to create a normally distributed uh, distribution for our data set. And by normalization, we mean that we are just scaling our data to a specific scale. It might be most of the time it is between zero and one, but other times you might want to scale your data between uh, any other given range. So most of the time you want, or you, what people do is they will scale their data to the range of zero and one. So standardization scales down features based on standard normal distribution. So all features now will have properties of standard normal distribution and standardization will help to handle outliers. And in general, you will standardize your data if you are going to be using machine learning or statistics techniques that assume that your data is normally distributed. Uh, it might be in the Gaussian uh, base and other uh, similar algorithms. So just to show you about the normalization and standardization, we'll be creating or we'll be generating a random points uh, of size 2000 by using np dot random dot exponential. This will just uh, generate uh, a data set of size 2000. And if we print the sample or if we take five samples from our data set, this will print the values for these uh, five samples. And we can also get the mean and the max uh, of those of the data sets that has been generated. So the mean is 0 0.01 and the max is about uh, 1418. So this is the distribution of the data that is generated. So when we try to standardize our data by standardizing, as I said earlier, we are trying to create a normal distribution. By normal distribution, not exactly normal, but we are trying to make sure that the mean of the distribution is zero and the standard deviation is uh, equal to one. So we can import the standard scalar, which can be imported from a scalar library. And by using the standard scalar, we can uh, transform our data and standardize it or scale it in a standard way, which will just uh, result into a data set that, is, uh, that has a mean of zero and standard deviation of one. So after standardizing it, we can plot it in a subplot, and this was the data that the original data that has been that hasn't been standardized, and this is the data that has been standardized. So as you can see, the mean will be equal to zero, and the standard deviation will almost be equal to one. So before standardization, the data was varying point had, had a varying points, but after using the standard 
uh, the standardization technique that we used, we'll make sure that our mean will be equal to zero and our standard deviation will be equal to one. And normalization is just the other way for scaling data. And by normalization, we'll be scaling our data to a specific range. It might be from minus one to one or from zero to one. But most of the time, what we'll be using or see others using is uh, scaling them down to the points zero to one. And uh, we can use the min max scalar. There are also other ways for even for standardization. I think the most popular method that you will see people using, especially when handling outliers, is the z-score standardization technique. And this is just one way of standardizing our data set, but you can also use the z-score or the z-score uh, method to standardize our data. So for normalization, you can use min-max scalar. So by using min-max scalar, we'll make sure that our data is in the points between zero and one. So I've printed the mean value and the max value of the data that has been normalized. So the mean value is, value is 0.0, .0 and the max value is 1.0. So the original data was looked like this, but after normalizing it, we, we can see that it is between 0 and 1. The minimum value is 0 and the maximum value is 1. And there are also other types that you can use uh, just to check the data types that I've also shown you er earlier. Uh, info will print out uh, more other additional information about the data that we have. It will, we can see that the NEN the NEN NEL values in the data type of each features in our data set. And yes, I think you can also use two numeric features if you uh, if some of the features in your data set aren't numeric, but they were supposed to be numeric. You can cast them to numeric by passing the the column that you want, and you can you will want to pass them uh, when there is an error or skip when there is an error. Uh, and this is just a utility function that you might want to use again and again, as I've said earlier. So you most mostly or usually what you'll do is you'll move those, these scripts to a separate uh, script, and uh, you'll be able to reuse them because for different data that you have, you want to reuse them without repeating those scripts again and again in your uh, code section. So you might want to use the format float, the find aggregation. These are just some of the uh, methods that you'd want to use, especially for this week's challenge. Some of them are in bytes and you, you, might, you might want to convert them to megabytes and so on. These are just helper function or utility functions that you'll be using for this week's challenge and you can get this uh, from this notebook. Uh, that's provided in the Google Drive. So to extract, you can use the value counts. And I think these are the basic things that we have done uh, above. Yes, and to read the Excel file, one of the files provided was an Excel file. You will be using the read Excel from Pandas. There is a method called read Excel, and you will have a look at what, uh, about the, data, the type of and the values of the data that you have and the data type of the data that you have. And you can have or gain a basic understanding or basic insight about the data that you are going to work on. Yes, I think this is it. Uh, any other question? Josias? Yes, yes. Uh, I, would like to, I would like to know when we can use the standardization and the normalization and what is better to use? Uh, yes, I think this is also a great question. So when you use standardization, I think it's mostly used uh, in algorithms in unsupervised machine learning or when you expect the data to be uh, in a normalized way or in a normally distributed way. In unsupervised learning like Keynes and Keynes and so on. But you'll be using uh, normalization when, I think the best example to use, or the best, uh, uh, yes, the best example to use the normalization is especially when you're working on CNNs. When using CNNs, you'll be mostly working on image classification or something related to image. So you want to normalize the data, mostly images are represented in pixels and they will contain values from zero to 255. So you'll want to normalize them uh, to put them in a, in a value ranging from zero to one or any range that you want to specify. But uh, I think if you have time and if the data set is really small, 
you can try out both and see which will result in a better accuracy. But normally, okay. I think standardization is mostly used in unsupervised learnings and in algorithms that expects you to have the data in a normal distributed way. Okay. Now, I would like you to come back on the codes where you were using Tiag and data cleaning. I did not understand. Uh, you used what? Uh, clean. I think it was Tiag and data clean. Yes, something this one. Yes, yes, I do not understand okay. that. Fact. Yes, this is just uh, a function that you can use. So let's say that you have uh, a feature or a column in your data set which is called uh, diag underscore one. Let's just say that you have this column. So you'll want maybe it's a numeric type or you want it in a numeric type, but it's actually not in a numeric way. So for example, if there is an age column, an age column is a numeric type, right? So for example, when reading using pandas, let's say it's not in a numeric type or it has a different data type. So what you will do is you will convert that to numeric by passing the column that you want to change to numeric. And if it gets any error, I think queries, what queries will do is it will skip those columns or those rows that has uh, errors, if, if I'm not wrong. I get it. So this is just to cast it to uh, numeric column. Okay. Well, thank you. Yes. Okay. Uh, yes, Abner? Um, I have uh, a question on uh the variables or the columns that we are using uh, was well, the question is uh, according to the problem that we have given uh, as described in the morning it's to to uh, drive uh, insights that the company will be profitable or not mm -hmm. so uh, our target is uh, to maximize the profit and uh, to predict that, or I don't know, to, to, to recommend that it's profitable or not, what is uh, the key indicator that we should select from uh, our data sets? And the second related question is, uh, we should have uh, a target variable that leads to our recommendation and uh, uh, a predictor variable that, that determines the target variable. So, should we have a target and uh, predictor variables in the data set or should we define? Uh, I'm not clear with that. Okay, good question, Asabna. So, uh, for the first question, I think this is what you are going to do, or this is the task that you are given. Uh, there is something called the feature import task that you are going to calculate. So, what feature importance does is that uh, it will. Uh, calculate or it will try to plot or in any way uh, display the important features. So in your data set, some features are more important or more uh, contributing to the data that you have or more satisfying to the customer that you are serving and some might not have that much importance or uh, might not have importance at all. So I think what you're going to do or what you're supposed to do is also one of the tasks, not all, but one of the things is uh, get the feature importance of the data that you are going to work on. And for the second question that, that is related to the prediction value or to the target variable, this is unsupervised learning. There isn't a specific target element that you want to predict or you want to calculate. So in unsupervised learning, there isn't a target variable or a specific label that you want uh, to use or uh, to predict in your data set. So you'll be using clustering algorithm. I think there will be sparsation on that, but you'll be using uh, an algorithm that will cluster your data into separate groups and identify them based on their clusters. Does it mean that the clusters are the indicators for the profitability or uh, what, what, what indicates? Yes, so uh, one of the, the clusters might be more suited to the customers. One of, some of them might not be uh, much more suited for the customer. So based on the cluster or based on the arrangement, 
you will make sure that or you can make sure that uh, the factors that are contributing to the success of the telecom company and the different features that are more relevant or more important in those clusters. Yes, Adna? Okay. Uh, Michael? Hello, hello. <clears throat> okay, hello. Uh, you did, yeah. I was just, uh, I, I want to ask about the skewness. We have measured uh, the skewness of the data before adding uh, or before removing the uh, uh, non-values or the not values in our data. And we, I think we have uh, agreed to use uh, me uh, for imputing or for adding, uh, for removing missing values from our data. Shouldn't mm. we first... Uh, uh, sh shouldn't we try for different methods based on the uh, based on the coefficient we have calculated there uh, to fill up the missing values? Yeah, yeah. Y yes, I think you're welcome to use any kind of methods that you think will be suitable for the algorithm that you are going to work on. Yeah, so, the thing is, the thing mm -hmm. is, I want to say that uh, when we are adding new values. Uh, to the data we might uh, probably we might lose the nature of the data so we, i think we should have to pre uh, visualize and post visualize after adding values to the uh, data having some particular or choosing some particular method of uh, adding values yes but do you think that uh, visualization alone will help you to spot if the method that used to feel the missing values uh, are correct. I think uh -huh. the, the final result that you can get is after uh, going through your machine learning models and your model might not be performing well if you have used the wrong method to fill up missing values or not. Yeah. So yeah. I think one way to do or one way to tune your data is by going, if you have used a completely wrong method to fill up missing values, your model will definitely perform not in a correct way. So I think that will be something that will go back and forth when uh, creating your model and developing your entire pipeline for your model. Okay, okay, thank you. Uh, Mohammed? So uh, to be more specific uh, for our today task, uh, we should load the data. Uh, that uh, that you are provided with, and uh, perform some cleaning and uh, uh, plotting, and mm. some standardization and normalization. Uh, is that uh, correct? Yes, yes. This is these are just the tips that you are going to work on uh, when performing any kind of machine learning algorithm. So the first thing is you uh, try to have a basic understanding of the data that you are going to work on, then perform some kind of cleaning on the data that you have and go on building your model. So these are the key or the essential steps when uh, working in kind of machine learning related problem. Okay, thank you. Okay, that's all. Yeah, uh, I, I was confused uh, about the features. Do you know, uh, do you have any idea which one we're supposed to use as the customer number or the user. I'm confused between the bearer ID, uh, the IMSI and the uh, MSI SDN number. Maybe you can help uh, me. Okay. okay, yes. Maybe I think, Fasa, what you can do is you can post, can you post this question like right now on Slack, on all week one uh, yeah. group, so that uh, maybe... Yeah. I will try to provide that after having a look at the data or some other tutors might provide you the information so that it will be helpful okay. for all trainees that aren't even in the call. I just okay. haven't Thank looked you. into the data yet, but I will definitely have a look yeah, after okay. the session and we'll get back to you. Okay, okay. Janet? Okay. Okay. okay, thank you very much for your clear and precise uh, presentation. Uh, my uh, question is, 
uh, in the distribution of data, you say that uh, if it is left, uh, right and normal, then if it is left, we substitute so with mode, uh, if it is right, with mean, and if it is normal, what uh, we are going to use, is it, is it the uh, No, you'll, you'll be using the mode if the data is categorical, or, or if the feature is categorical, or if okay. it's object data type. You'll be using mean or median for numeric values. Okay. 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 Thank you. Thank you so much. Okay. Uh, Gideon? Uh, I had a question on how we'll be uh, submitting the, the the tasks required. Will we be using? Will we be submitting the Python code or a Jupyter notebook? Uh, okay, hello, Gideon. I'm sorry. Uh, I got help. Uh, can you can you hear me? Yes, I can hear you. Uh, I had a question on how we'll be submitting the different tasks. Are we supposed to just uh, commit the codes, the Python codes we we worked on on GitHub, or are we supposed to commit the Jupyter notebooks? So you'll be using, or you'll be uh, after working on Jupyter notebook or or even on your own uh, local machine, you'll add those files on your uh, project directory and you'll be committing those files uh, in your GitHub, or not on your GitHub, but on your directory, then finally pushing them to GitHub. So what we'll do is we'll track what you did on each day and what you worked on your notebook and we'll evaluate the results accordingly. Uh, so we're, we're supposed to push both the notebook and the scripts we worked on? Yes, yes. Because okay. there is no other way to look at the notebook or the expressions that you are going to work on. Uh, so the notebooks, uh, they're mainly there for the visualization outputs and the different outputs. Is that correct? Uh, not only for the visualizations, but we are also going to work on the machine learning model, exploratory analysis, uh, and maybe also, yes, mostly the machine learning model in the, the exploratory data analysis. We'll be using the notebooks for uh, EDE and the model that we are going to build on. Okay, but the code are the same, the, the, they're the same code, the ones we'll use on the Jupyter notebooks and the scripts. It's just so, the Jupyter notebooks will have an output. Is that the point? Yes, I think the main point of using the notebook inside your directory or inside your project file is just uh, to gain the insight of what you are working on. Or uh, let's say your scripts are just a wrapper that, or they are just methods that have different functions like visualization, different types of plots, and different types of models. So you'll be importing those scripts from the scripts, let's say from the scripts file or scripts module and use them in the notebooks uh, file so that you can use those scripts to visualize or analyze or even uh, model your data. Okay, thank you. Okay, any more question, Margaret? Um, my question is about um, what we've done and the task task one point one exactly. So task one point one requires us to aggregate by user the number of XDR sessions, um, total downloads, etc. Are we supposed to do this um, after or before that? Uh, extraction and transformation or are we, are we supposed to do it before or after? Uh, so I think this is part of the exploratory data analysis. So uh, I'm currently opening the file. Yes. So on task one, one of the tasks is to start by identifying the top 10 handsets used by customers. So this is part of exploratory data analysis. So after loading your data, you will be able to uh, 
get or gain some kind of understanding from your data. So you can, let's say, analyze the data so that you'll be able to visualize the top 10 handsets used by the customers, top, uh, the top three handset manufacturers, and so on. So this is part of the EDA process. Um, but are we supposed to do that uh, before or after um, extracting our data? Uh, okay. If I, for me, write, to get, if I want to get the top 10 handsets and maybe my the data that I have has a lot of missing values, so am I supposed to use the data that has been fixed or has not been fixed for me to get the top 10 handsets and top three handsets? Oh, okay. I think that's also a good question. So you'll mostly be using those cleaning or fixing when you are mostly going to work on the machine learning model. So you are normalizing or standardizing or fixing some of the data when you are going to model your data because those are important for your machine learning model, not for the analytics part. Sometimes you might use, or you'll also see some using them uh, before analysis, but most of the time you'll be using them uh, for the modeling part. But for the analysis, like identifying the top chance manufacturers, you want to get an insight from the data that you have without uh, working much on the cleaning or pre-processing. Okay, thanks. Uh, okay, then. Uh, if there are no more questions, I think this will be the end of the session. And Ten Academy can stop the recording. And